Radically Open Security was uh, started kind of as a bit of a reaction from, uh, I would say, hackers in the community that were not entirely satisfied with uh, the direction the security industry has taken. We believe that there's not enough openness and transparency. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, for a topic as important as computer security, <laughs> mm -hmm. you would expect that you're going to have some amount of openness and transparency from your vendors. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, like I said, just to really sort of underscore the fact that, uh, that we're really different. It's one thing to say you're different, it's another thing to actually be different. <laughs> and uh, that, that was why we decided to finally give away uh, the majority of our profits to uh, basically the community and uh, to support open source instead of just getting uh, the founders and, and some investor or something rich. So. Yeah. And, and, and the words uh, radically, why is that important? Um, you know, I, I thought, of course, very carefully when choosing the name of the company, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, with the word uh, with the word radically, you know, I, I think that uh, you know the kind of people who who started our company certainly come from, yeah, activistic if not radical points of view. <laughs> I know the word radical makes some people uncomfortable because, of course, uh, when you you think about the word. For example, radical in Dutch, mm -hmm. uh, that, that brings up sometimes a lot of uh, connotations like a radical groupering and that, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, for us, I mean, radical doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I mean, it's like looking at groups like Anonymous. I mean, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. <laughs> you know, you, you can consider them to be a nuisance <laughs> yep. because they're dosing your site, uh, or you can also consider them to be uh, useful because they're helping using technical, technological means to promote. Uh, uh, well, perhaps important social dialogue. <laughs> I mean, either way, I mean, uh, people can have opinions about these things, but I personally embrace the word radical and perhaps the uh, sort of uh, maybe uncomfortable feeling that it might give some people <laughs> because it, give, it, it gets people to think. And anyway, I also believe that radically open security is going to make just our existence and the way that we work is going to make some people uncomfortable, <laughs> especially, you know, some of the companies in the industry as it is right now, just because the way in which we work with the openness and transparency and the open source is so drastically different than the way that a lot of other companies work that I'm, I'm hoping that we can actually put pressure <laughs> on them and put pressure on the rest of the industry to actually change and also, you know, hope that the customers will become more demanding and will start demanding that kind of openness and transparency that uh, we are offering. So, And that, that shift is needed in your opinion right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you hire in a computer security company, uh, you know, I, I don't personally find it acceptable. And of course, I've, I've worked uh, also for some large companies and I've also been on the customer side <laughs> in dealing with, uh, with some uh, mm -hmm. security consultancy companies. And when they basically come in and you know, for, for some kind of job that you're hiring them for. And then uh, you say, hey, you know, I would really like to look over your shoulder because I want to learn from you guys because, you know, you're really good and we want to increase our own internal capacities. Um, you know, if then the consultant turns to you and says, you know, wh who are you? And, you know, we're the experts and you hired us in and we're elite and you're not going to understand it anyway. So just, you know, step back, let us do our job <laughs> and we'll give you the report at the end. You know, I mean, that's just, in my opinion, not a good attitude to have mm -hmm. <laughs> because, I mean, you know, the companies that do that, that operate that way think that it's good because they, they're keeping the customer in the dark <laughs> and they're not sharing their knowledge and their information so that, uh, you know, the, the customer can build up their own internal capacity. And of course, in such a way, they are increasing the dependence of the customer on the consultancy business. And, you know, for them, maybe economically in the short term, that seems <laughs> like an attractive proposition. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I mean, you know, you're, you're not really truly serving the customer as you should be because the end goal should be to allow organizations, whether it's companies or government or <laughs> not-for-profits. I mean, the whole point of hiring in the security consultancy company is that we're supposed to help them to build their own internal capacity. And if you're only going to do a half a job in being open about, you know, and sharing with them what you're doing, I'm not going to say why bother, but it's just, you know, you're only half helping. <laughs> and, and why do customers accept that? I mean, I think they only accept it right now because, you know, that's sort of the status quo in, mm -hmm. in the market. But I think if we can offer something better, I think that customers will start to see that. They will start to walk away from those other companies and start coming to us. And that's, as I said, I think going to put some, uh, put some <laughs> economic pressure on those other companies to change. Yeah. So, so in this case, open is uh, in the relationship with your customers. That's what the open stands for. Yeah, I mean, open in, in many different ways. I mean, openness, uh, indeed, in, in, in sharing our knowledge with the customers, but also open in terms of open source. I mean, basically, I want to optimize our company to really 
give value <laughs> you know, to the community at large. And the tools th that we develop for ourselves, I, I aspire that we can release all of them into the open source just on GitHub. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't even want to have an internal G Git repo. I just want you know, GitHub <laughs> and the story. I mean, obviously, there's some sensitive uh, customer uh, confidential stuff that uh, obviously we have to uh, deal with professionally. But, uh, but anything in terms of you know, scripts and, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and frameworks uh, that we build, I, I would fully love to release. Um, other things in terms of openness that we've been doing with customers so far that I think no other <laughs> consultancy company in the universe actually does is uh, we've actually been inviting customers to send uh, a number of people to actually join us as volunteers on the pen tests. And the way that we do our pen tests is we, uh, well, I work with a lot of capture the flag players. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, capture the flag is basically a kind of uh, hacking competition. and. Uh, well, uh, what we do is we use uh, IRC uh, for as our main form of communication because we also have a 100% uh, distributed team. So uh, we also we work with Dutch consultants, some German consultants. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, but but the advantage of having uh, a distributed team is we can very easily include the customer in what we're doing <laughs> because if, if all of our communications happen on IRC, it's extremely easy to also invite the customer to join us. Mm -hmm. And then we use Etherpads for um, uh, organizing our information. And and, and the way then that it works is, and especially for crystal box pen testing, this is actually great, uh, we actually have the customer there working as pen testers. So if we need any kind of information, the turnaround time is five seconds. <laughs> Could you explain crystal box? Oh, I'm sorry. Cr crystal box pen testing means uh, if you are doing a penetration test and uh, they want you to work quickly and efficiently in finding bugs instead of just uh, bumping around <laughs> with no okay. information. Yeah. So they supply you with whatever information that you need. So it's giving you basically their prior knowledge and expertise of the uh, of the system, but that is to expedite your process of finding bugs. So you're not just uh, banging on things that they know about already. You know, <laughs> just trying to prove you know, how good you are as a yeah. hacker. Yeah, so it's a more efficient way of uh, finding uh, flaws for them. Mm. Anyway, yeah, the series of the series of interviews is called "Fix the Internet." Yes. Um, um, is the internet broken? <laughs> In many ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it were not, but if it were not broken, I wouldn't be invited here. No, so that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, what do you find important? Uh, important bits that are broken or need to be fixed. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, coming from my perspective as a, you know, uh, <laughs> co-founder of a computer security consultancy company, I mean, the part uh, of the internet that's broken that we're focusing on, of course, is uh, is on the security side of things. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the internet was built in a time of trust and in a time of uh, when things were. You could have the keep the overview in your head, and it was built in a time of goodwill. <laughs> and uh, of course, there's you know the old uh, anecdote about uh, Richard Stallman who uh, used to uh, refuse uh, you know to set passwords <laughs> just because uh, information no should be free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he had he had the best of intentions, <laughs> but of course, you know that was then, and this is now. Yeah. <laughs> and and the world, you know that uh, that uh, you know DARPANET <laughs> had you know at the time when uh, when the internet was first being formed, of course, uh, it has completely changed now uh, into, uh, yeah, essentially the, the modern world <laughs> as it is offline, but then uh, now uh, online. And that, of course, also includes the criminal element and uh, people with uh, various uh, yeah, nationalistic or activistic or sometimes even, uh, uh, well, warfare uh, types of <laughs> points mm -hmm. of view. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, these days, of course, all of the... Uh, motivations and, and sometimes negative activities that people carry on offline now translates to online because so much of our offline world has become online. Yeah. And are there people or organizations to blame for the brokenness of internet or is it just a... Um, you know, it's super easy to lay blame, but I mean, I don't think retroactively we could have done it any better <laughs> because you know, I mean, I know that there's this whole uh, let's fix the internet thing. I know also for years and years and years. I'm also a former academic, by the way. From uh, <laughs> I was a former assistant professor of computer science at the uh, Free University of Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that people have been submitting grant proposals forever. I mean, with a theme like Internet 2.0 or and then Internet 3.0 and then, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the best minds <laughs> in uh, computer science have mm -hmm. been working for quite some time on trying to to 
build a, a new or better internet or to retrofit fit, uh, the current uh, <laughs> broken internet with uh, improvements to make it better. I mean, I think that, you know, gradually the situation on the one hand, te technically speaking, is getting better, but of course at the same time the complexity of the internet is increasing, increasing at such a rate that uh, while the technical things are side of it is improving a bit, you know, just with the sheer complexity and the amount that, of data and the amount that's at stake <laughs> is increasing that, uh, yeah, of course, uh, the situation now is, is, is of course, uh, more critical uh, than, than it ever has been. So. Yeah. And did Snowden bring you any news on these? <laughs> right. Yeah, um, I think the security industry and its practitioners have long been paranoid. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and have been warning for these kinds of things. And I think really what Snowden was, was an unhappy justification of what we had suspected for a long time. Except that maybe even, it even went further than what we expected. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I mean, on the one hand, some people are vindicated, but on the other hand, I don't think it makes anyone happy. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, also for me personally, also with the with the Snowden revelations, this was also for me another personal motivation with the starting a radically open security yeah. as well, because of course there's a number of players that are extremely active in things like selling zero days to intelligence agencies, and like I'm sorry, but that makes me angry, <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure that's I'm not the only hacker in mm -hmm. our community that that makes angry, <laughs> and 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 one of our you know core principles in our company is basically no sketchy stuff, which is just like you know none of that shit, no selling zero days to no. intelligence agencies or hacking activists or whatnot. But it's just, you know, but, but that's, yeah. But, but a lot of that I think came from, uh, came from Snowden. And uh, I think just really, I mean, similar to also, uh, of course, Julian Assange and, uh, and WikiLeaks, it was just uh, bringing things into the light that we perhaps subconsciously already knew. But, uh, but it just now, now made it more critical than ever, <laughs> you know, that, that, it's the time. The time has come that we we have to actively do things about it. Yep. So what do you have to? So in uh, well, in this world, and you say, uh, for example, thanks to Snowden, we know now what we maybe already thought that was happening. What what should that mean, for example, for companies uh, uh, you work for? What did that does or did that change for them? Um, you know, I think that uh, what it changes uh, for companies in particular is uh, think about. The vendors you're working with. Think critically. Think about how much visibility you have into what they're doing. They're putting boxes into your network. Do you have access to those boxes? <laughs> Do you have root on those boxes? Can you observe from the inside what those boxes are doing? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, <laughs> then There's why do you problem. trust it? <laughs> I mean, you can sit there and say, oh, but you know, it's a big company and we've used them forever and I'm sure it'll be good, but you know, <laughs> Are we still that naive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's, I think, one of the lessons that we should have learned from Snowden <laughs> is that uh, we can say, oh, well, this you know, particular company would never be working with an intelligence agency you know, to, to collect uh, information from our internal network with this black box and then send it uh, somewhere to be analyzed. You know? uh, and of course, you know, also within the Netherlands particularly, uh, of course, uh, we also know that the IV Day works uh, together with, uh, <laughs> with the American intelligence mm -hmm. agencies, so essentially uh, any company or vendor that might pot potentially give things uh, to the IV day, uh, you know, <laughs> means uh, you, you know you're also potentially giving things indirectly uh, to uh, to the uh, to the NSA <laughs> yeah. or CIA or whichever. And you know, I mean, we can sit there and be naive and say, oh, they would never do that. But you know, maybe that's not so naive anymore because <laughs> it's really been proven that we're in a world now that uh, that, that that crypto standards are being backdoored. <laughs> And that uh, also backdoors uh, are being put into uh, several commercial products, <laughs> you know, in cooperation with certain vendors. It's certainly been demonstrated with a number of American vendors. Yep. You know, why do we think we would be immune, immune to it here in the Netherlands? <laughs> yep. So, I mean, th and this is also part of why I think it's important to have an open and transparent relationship with your vendors. I mean, if you can't inspect what they're putting into your network, why are you using it? I mean, I, I don't think the eye of a day themselves would allow somebody to put a black box in their network, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I've heard indirectly from other people that they actually also insist upon open source <laughs> yeah. because so they can also actually audit, you know, what's going into their network. And I mean, sorry, but if, if that's, if, <laughs> if open source is the only thing that's good enough for the eye of a day, then shouldn't open source also be the only thing that's good enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> 
So that, that's, that is the important thing, because uh, open source, one of the important thing is, of course, that you can, uh, well, with more hands, you can make more new stuff. Yeah. But you say it, the other thing that makes it really important is that you can see what it is, does, etc. Yeah. I mean, and of course, open source isn't going to give you any guarantees, because, of course, uh, certainly, you know, uh, some of the recent uh, SSL flaws and uh, whatnot have... Well, uh, right there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I have, pro have proven that sometimes even the you know many eyes <laughs> that make the bugs shallow sometimes isn't enough, uh, and, and that's also why I think I'm happy that excellent initiatives like Hacker One mm -hmm. are uh, sponsoring also uh, uh, bug bounties uh, for open source uh, software projects, and I think it all helps. Uh, so of course, uh, open source and it's the transparency that comes with it. It's not a holy grail. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's uh, there's still going to be problems, and it's just a, a sheer result of the complexity you yep. know, that comes from the number of lines of code uh, in the software. And you can't get rid of that completely, of course. But at the same time, you know, as easy as it is to, to, criti uh, to criticize OpenSSL and, and related libraries that have been vulnerable lately, uh, you know, the, the next question that we can ask is, yeah, but is proprietary software any better? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and? <laughs> well, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I mean, also within our company, we're certainly audit auditing. <laughs> <laughs> proprietary uh, things uh, with customers as well. And of course, uh, there's just as many problems in that. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the companies involved are not necessarily as open uh, in telling mm -hmm. you uh, about uh, the issues. And of course, that can present itself with uh, yeah. its own set of uh, problems. So I think sort of the, the, the line of the, the, the thing that keeps repeating today in a series of interviews is that we've gone uh, from uh, uh, an internet of trust yes. uh, to an internet where your basic thing is more distrust. Right. Well, or maybe it's a trust but verify. I mean, because I think the internet is starting to uh, starting to resemble the real world a bit more. I mm -hmm. mean, complete trust we're never going to have, <laughs> you know. And and also, you know, from a security perspective, it of course it's all about making trade offs. I mean, every time we do an online transaction, <laughs> you know, we're taking a risk and. Uh, you know, I also use online banking <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of the uh, modern uh, amenities, you know, even though I am a security practitioner myself and I'm fully aware of a number of the security and privacy risks <laughs> that that entails. <laughs> but all the same, I mean, we have to make individual uh, trade-offs about uh, what uh, security risks we're willing to accept versus the utility that it brings us. Of course, that's the same thing as uh, dealing with the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, also uh, in my dealing with you guys, you know, I have to consider how much do I trust you versus, you know, how much uh, am, am I potentially able to get hurt uh, <laughs> for what I'm doing. I mean, yeah, but uh, the different <laughs> thing is that you, uh, you hire people because you trust them to do their job right mm -hmm. in your uh, and I think nowadays in the internet you hire people in your mm -hmm. your field of, of work yes and you don't know what they're doing and you don't know if they're uh, handling in your in your uh, benefit yeah but every time end. but every time I go to a restaurant I mean I don't know who's preparing the food for me I mean you know no, I'm, where, I'm, where, I'm, where they bought the stuff and yeah I mean I'm completely reliant on people that mm. I, I don't know, I mean, yep. in, in my real life. And <laughs> I don't think it can be any other way. I mean, yep. I think that fundamentally our, our society is built upon trust, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it, or even whether or not we like it. I mean, we're, uh, our culture is so interwoven that, uh, I mean, unless you go completely off the grid and become a hermit, it's uh, almost impossible to, to get away from the situation where we have to trust yeah, other people. Yeah, and a society based on distrust isn't a nice society, probably. No, you wouldn't, it's not a society I would no. want to live in. And it's the same to a certain extent uh, with the internet. I mean, I think uh, to a certain extent, you know, mm -hmm. we need to, to maintain trust, otherwise there will be no internet, and otherwise there will be no e-commerce, and otherwise there will be no, you know, social networking and whatnot. Uh, you know, we can have our own opinion, our own opinions of these things, whether or not social networking is a good thing or not. But uh, but all the same, you know, uh, I think a lot of people have a lot of utility and a lot of benefit from a lot of these things. And ultimately, uh, a lot of people, despite the risks uh, and despite the fact that some things are broken, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, still do accept that uh, the, the, the gains and the benefits that they get from all mm -hmm. of this technological progress is, uh, is worth it to them. Yeah. And the, the uh, so say the, the, the essence of, or to a lot of people, of the internet is say the distributed uh, side uh, of it. 
and um, and open source is that of course an uh, example uh, mm -hmm. of. But say the the big players mm -hmm. uh, are all sort of uh, one size, uh, well, not one size fits all. But they they're like there's no hardly competition. So Facebook is there's only one party to to facilitate our uh, uh, social network in that sense. Maybe Twitter besides yeah. that, or of course Google mm -hmm. is is, a, uh, um, is is an example um, of that. Is, uh, can that be, be different or is, is that the, the, the essence of the internet as well? That, that because you can uh, um, reach the whole world, uh, yeah. there will always be one party that does it all? Well, I don't necessarily think that there is one party that does it all. I mean, I think there's certainly a number of uh, parties. I mean, we, we can, of course, focus on Facebook and Google and uh, and, and Twitter and, and Amazon and you know and a lot of the large players and to, to be sure you know they're super <laughs> hubs mm -hmm. that are, are uh, certainly facilitating a tremendous amount of, uh, of traffic um, and interaction. At the same time, though, you also have the 4chan's and the uh, <laughs> some people that are still using IRC <laughs> and uh, other uh, perhaps uh, Jabber clients uh, with uh, servers running in different locations. So I mean, some things uh, for sure I think are still still uh, decentralized, um, but. Yeah, I mean, but as for the super nodes, uh, like you know the Facebooks and the Googles, it's it's a hard problem. I mean, they got that way because they offer a value to people, mm -hmm. and uh, if they didn't offer that true value, then uh, we wouldn't be using them. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, we need to uh, keep, you know keep checks and balances. I mean, it's also the same thing with uh, with, with Microsoft and what that used to be. Of course, uh, we, we always thought that Microsoft would never uh, be dethroned. And then uh, slowly but surely, uh, <laughs> Microsoft is, yeah. is, is becoming overtaken yeah. <laughs> by the uh, by the newer players. And uh, But who, who should guard those checks and balances? Is there one party or is it several organizations or is it institutions or is it companies yeah. like your own? Right. I think it's it's kind of multi-layered. I mean, I think it needs to happen at cer certain levels. I mean, I think uh, you know it certainly needs to happen on on the grassroots level. <laughs> so I certainly think uh, good initiatives uh, like this one, and also for as of right now, I would consider my company to be pretty grassrootsy as well. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> maybe someday we'll get yeah. get a little bigger, but uh, but all the same, I mean, you know, I think those things are all good and important. I think bits of freedom is is absolutely amazing, and then the EFF, and uh, you know, I mean, and and uh, also the uh, consumer uh, organization. Uh, the protection organizations that are out there. I mean, that's all cer certainly important. You also, on the governmental side, uh, of course, need uh, need them to be proactive <laughs> about uh, looking into these issues and uh, making sure that uh, the law is from framed in an appropriate way that uh, <laughs> companies are, are kept into check and uh, and to make sure that things are actually enforced when uh, things uh, go wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, at the same time, of course, uh, on a personal level, I mean, we need to uh, make our own choices about what we want to put on the internet and, and what we want to use it for or what we don't. Uh, so that's personal responsibility. Um, and also as individuals, even working for companies, we can also make sure that in our role as employee, we can also make sure that we bring a conscience to those larger companies. <laughs> And uh, you know, as individuals, we can choose to speak up, and we can choose to uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> make sure that the right considerations uh, are are taking place also within the larger organizations. So, so. You that, do you see that happening within the larger organizations? Changes in um, depends. I mean, sometimes, sometimes no. No, <laughs> it just it depends on the company. It depends on its culture. And of course, I don't have a view within every organization, so I can't necessarily answer that. Uh, completely no. so but also and as far as uh, individual choice I think also the media and the art artists and <laughs> and people who carry messages very well journalists I think also you know it's it's their role to play <laughs> you know also the Brenner the, the Vinters out there you know mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to also keep doing what they're doing uh, also to uh, make sure that people are aware of the fact that they have a personal choice <laughs> And, uh, and that they have a personal responsibility. And yep. of course, having this kind of media, uh, such as the production right here, I think also uh, helps play an important role. Hmm. I uh, earlier on asked you what, what, say, what a company um, uh, should do. If I take that to a personal level, what should a, 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 a person uh, that goes online those days uh, well, do for its own privacy or what? what, what uh, yeah. If you would advise me as a security expert, sure. Uh, uh, how, <laughs> what do I do on the internet, and how should I do it? Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, 
Well, you first need to realize there is no privacy on the internet. <laughs> and you need to realize also that the even security on the internet is uh, by and large a, a, one big happy illusion. <laughs> I mean, it's statistics. I mean, it's the same thing with getting in a car and uh, driving somewhere. I mm. mean, maybe you'll get in an accident, maybe you won't. You know, chances are if you drive around enough, eventually you might have an accident. And if you do, you hope it's not too uh, serious. But it's exactly the same thing with, uh, <laughs> with using the internet. I mean, so many things are so incredibly broken that, I mean, if somebody wants to hack you, they will. You know, and if somebody wants to uh, to break into your company, they they will. <laughs> I mean, there you know, again, software is so complex these days, uh, and, and, and just the constellation of all the different uh, <laughs> moving pieces, it's almost impossible to put things together now in such a way that uh, that that you can't break into it uh, as a hacker, or perhaps, or especially as something like an intelligence agency. So we just have to accept that. I mean, it's. You know, we're playing a kind of Russian roulette when we're out there, and we just have to ask ourselves, you know, how much benefit am I getting, and how much do I stand to lose? We need to make sure, for example, that we make backups <laughs> uh, of uh, the data that's important to us. We need to think really carefully about what we actually put in uh, digital form, <laughs> you know, from our lives. Mm. Once that exists, we need to uh, think very carefully about how much of that uh, then, you know, gets attached to some computer that's online. <laughs> so what you're saying besides those points that uh, an individual doesn't have any agency nowadays on the internet? Well, there's bad and worse. I mean, <laughs> total security is, there's, there isn't. But at the same time, again, you don't necessarily need total security in all cases. I mean, sometimes just increasing your chances. I mean, it's the same thing with having a bicycle in, in Amsterdam. I mean, sometimes you just need, need to have a bigger lock than the next guy <laughs> to prevent your bike from getting stolen. So, you know, so I mean, there's certainly, you know, ways in which you can, you know, sort of have bigger locks on, uh, on, on your computer use <laughs> and internet use. And uh, certainly there's a number of really great uh, tools out there uh, that can, you, you can use to help uh, improve your security and privacy online. I mean, you, if you have, uh, uh, if you do have Windows PCs, which I, I would recommend you don't, but if you do, I mean, there's antivirus <laughs> that you should uh, most certainly uh, use and update, <laughs> by the way. Yep. I mean, it's no guarantee, but it's certainly better than nothing. You also have personal firewall programs. If you're going to browse, there's excellent uh, things like Tor uh, that are out there uh, that you can use to uh, help anonymize your traffic. You can use VPN tunnels. Uh, you should also think uh, very carefully before using open Wi-Fi hotspots, um, <laughs> just because, uh, yeah. Well, you know, other things uh, certainly that you can do, you know, try and maximize your use of any kind of encrypted protocol, you know, as much uh, as you can. So, uh, you know, if you have to, uh, well, basically use encryption uh, anytime you have a choice <laughs> in the matter. Uh, but of course, for a lot of sort of typical normal people, mm -hmm. uh, that's either not a choice uh, yeah. or they don't understand how, uh, you know. And, and, and how should we get there, make them understand how? Um, well, for, for normal people, there, there's for only normal people. Yeah. yeah, for normal yeah. people. <laughs> Norm, yeah, normal. <laughs> um, you for know, my mother. Always, it's always my mother. Yeah. <laughs> there's two ways. I mean, one part of it is we have to do it for them behind the scenes. <laughs> You know, so as technologists and designing things, uh, we actually have to be there <laughs> yeah. to uh, to build in security that they're not even aware of. I mean, because uh, to a certain extent, uh, you know, people can't be trained. No. That being that being said, though, I mean, there is a, some amount of awareness training, of course, that we can do, <laughs> and also uh, in excellent initiatives like privacy cafes uh, that are out there. I mm -hmm. think that's all uh, quite excellent. Of course, you know, they they tend tend not to get norm you know normal people either. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, certainly trying to put the message out there into popular media, uh, mass media and popular culture, I mean, probably helps, but uh, to a certain extent, I mean, even training, while it's, it's a good thing to approach, is nice and important, but at the same time, you know, those of us who really do spend our day jobs <laughs> working mm -hmm. on this, you know, also need to uh, try and uh, put enough uh, safety nets uh, so that uh, when people inevitably do make mistakes, and they will, uh, that uh, maybe we can minimize the damage a bit. And, and do the, um, the normal people, uh, is there a lot of damage to them at the moment? Is there, a, is there enough reasons for them to, uh, uh, to be so secure? Yeah. Because we all think, oh, it's it's. I'm not interested. Uh, interesting to uh, to other people to uh, 
to 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 burgle my uh, my computer or whatever it is. So is there do we do we need examples? Do we need say the neighbor that's uh, has been uh, uh, the victim of uh, of something? Right. Because so far uh, we read it in the, in the in the you read it in the paper, you see something on television, and then you think, oh, uh, mm. I have to do a lot of stuff. And I, when I hear all the things I need to do, you tell them, ah, oh, come on, no mm. one, no one needs me. I'm not interesting to them. Right. Look, it depends on what your definition of damage is. I mean, I think a lot of damage has been done already. I mean, and for example, that uh, I mean, just the fact that. Uh, well, sorry to harp on this again, but intelligence agencies uh, have uh, visibility into everything we're posting, you mm -hmm. know, on, on Facebook and into all of everything that we're doing with Google, all of our emails, all of our search queries. Imagine now, I mean, right now we think it doesn't affect us because we're like, okay, the NSA can see it, so what? Now, imagine the day when a hacker can break into the NSA and he dumps that database. And now all of a sudden, every email you have ever sent with Gmail and every Google search that you have ever done. And people use Google, Google like a, like a therapist these mm. days. <laughs> so, I mean, even <laughs> I'm, I'm just as guilty of that. If I look at my own Google <laughs> yeah. queries, yeah. <laughs> it's actually pretty horrifying, you know, in the yeah. amount of detail, you can see a log of your, your thoughts and activities, you know, through things like Google searches. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah. Now, now imagine that that gets dumped <laughs> onto BitTorrent and imagine now that everybody can see that. Now you tell me how much damage <laughs> has already been done. And, and, and chances are at some point that day will come. Mm -hmm. I mean, people posted, you know, back in the, uh, uh, you know, back in the 80s uh, stuff onto Usenet without realizing that it would be archived <laughs> and that it would live forever. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, my mom works, you know, worked in IT back in the day and uh, even now she has, you know, posts on alt.games, you know, and these kinds of things, you know. <laughs> that yep. she can look up and she was like, man, I didn't know back then when I was posting that, that that was, but you know, but now if you look for it, I mean, that stuff is just out there and, uh, you know, all that palindrome or whatever. I mean, <laughs> all kinds of funny stuff like that. Yep. But, uh, but all the same, you know, why are we so naive as to think that, you know, at some point some hacker or activist, <laughs> activistically motivated hacker isn't going to break in and, and dump this stuff? I mean, Granted, of course, once it gets dumped, uh, just the actual logistics of going through it uh, would be enough to keep several PhD students busy. But uh, <laughs> and then, by the way, once that stuff is dumped, uh, you can bet a bunch of people will be doing their PhDs uh, based upon that. But yeah. uh, but all the same, you know, it's just you know that to me is incredibly frightening. <laughs> um, and if you combine that, then of course, uh, with all of the small smaller individual cases <laughs> mm -hmm. of uh, you know identity. Uh, theft and uh, banking fraud uh, and, and, and other, as you were saying, case by case examples that you might have with a neighbor or, or somebody else that you know. I mean, I feel bad for, you know, for those people you know, that get fished or that uh, you know, get trojaned and, and, and that have those kinds of incidents happen. But what re really scares me about the whole idea of, of Google databases getting dumped is that doesn't, ju that doesn't just affect uh, uh, some people. I mean, mm -hmm. that affects almost everybody. And to you, that's a real, realistic uh, future. Yes. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if that doesn't happen at some point. Huh? But shouldn't there be more incidents like, I don't know, credit card uh, theft or before people start acting the way you and maybe we would like them to act to secure themselves better? <sighs> yeah. Will there be a tipping point maybe or? Can you foresee a tipping point in this? Uh, Not right now, because I don't, I don't think that we can rely on people to make the right decision. I think that us as technologists have the larger responsibility <laughs> for trying to build in more fail-safes. I mean, because the, the honest truth of the matter is even very security-conscious technical people are going to do the wrong thing. I mean, also within our, uh, my company, we've mm -hmm. also done things like spear phishing uh, demonstrations with some of our customers. And our customers are very savvy, technically educated, <laughs> security aware people. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We sent the phishing emails, they click. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 and also other people, other security professionals, professionals that I know have also gotten their own machines compromised. So, I mean, really the question is if the security professionals can't get it right, how do we think that everybody, everybody else is going to get it right? But you think there's a main responsibility 
at the tech for the technical people right now in in fixing the internet yeah i believe so because uh you know to a certain extent i mean people are people we're going to be tired we're going to be hungry we're going to be distracted <laughs> you know we're we're going to make the wrong decisions sometimes mm -hmm. i make i make the wrong decisions sometimes but you know despite that fact you know we can build in some backups <laughs> we can build in some uh, some detection into our systems and uh, some uh, some kind, different kinds of uh, threat intelligence uh, to try and make sure that when people do make mistakes, uh, we, we can try and make sure that we're uh, looking at the traffic uh, that happens in the background and uh, analyzing it and uh, hopefully trying to put some intelligence into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, the problem is right now, it's just, it's not a box you can just buy from someone <laughs> that's going to fix all your problems. I mean, there's, uh, of course, a number of vendors that are trying <laughs> and that offer those kinds of products. But the problem is just that, it's so context dependent <laughs> on what's normal traffic and what's abnormal traffic that, of yep. course, every organization needs to, uh, I mean, it's really research. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it is the kind of thing that academics are looking at. And, and also, again, P people can do PhDs on, uh, but it's just, it's a long road and it's going to be a lot of work. And it, uh, this is also, as I said before, why I think it's going to require a lot of openness and, and close collaboration between uh, some of the companies with their problem, their individual problems, and then also with, with researchers and also uh, domain experts uh, that can work together with them to try and provide more bespoke and uh, customized solutions. Because mm -hmm. yeah, when you say uh, yeah, it's, it's us, the technologists, that, that should uh, do something about it, but uh, I, uh, is there a, a, a united technologist uh, uh, thing? For example, companies, or early on we were talking to people who say there's more um, uh, attention to innovation mm -hmm. than to fixing stuff or do, than to dump stuff that's not, not good. The most of the attention and the money goes to new stuff, right. uh, uh, new possibilities instead of uh, making good what uh, should be better. So, right. so how, how uh, uh, yeah, how are the technologies going to do this? Right. Um, well, first of all, I don't think we necessarily need a unified front. I mean, generally, anything that gets unified is, is capable of becoming corrupted in some form. So, <laughs> <laughs> so probably having a, a small Decentral. decentralized uh, approach to solving it is better. <laughs> Uh, but that being said, I mean, I think that, of course, uh, the industry is becoming increasingly security aware. I mean, it's still not where it needs to be, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly in, in the larger companies, there's a lot more budget for security than there used to be. I mean, granted, there's still a very large innovation, innovation budget. I'm not even necessarily going to say that that's wrong either, because without the innovation, again, we also wouldn't have all of the modern uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, tools and, and, and conveniences uh, that we have. So, I mean, that at least 50% uh, of the budget, you know, is, is going to innovation, I mean, is, is completely understandable. I mean, that's, that's forward progress, and we would want to bring that to a standstill. But at the same time, you know, the companies are making trade-offs in the same way that people individually are making trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of putting into their minds where that trade-off lies. You know, because perhaps for some organizations, they don't realize what the risks are well enough to make the appropriate trade-offs. Some organizations do. But, I mean, that's why it's actually extremely useful to do things like uh, conduct uh, tests within your own organization. How easily can you be hacked, actually? How easily can you be spearfished, <laughs> actually? You know, what other kinds of risks uh, are you guys running? You know, because a lot of companies will probably say, yeah, but we don't have a problem. But, you know, do they know that? I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes you, it's not until you, you know, t take it and, 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 you know, slap them like a, a big fish, you know, in the head, you know, <laughs> with, 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 with the facts that they actually say, crap, we have a problem. <laughs> it's time to, uh, to start uh, <laughs> doing something about it. And uh, that's a process. I mean, just uh, making the companies internally more aware. And yep. I think, you know, half of what we can do that helps with that is actually show them how vulnerable they are. <laughs> I mean, that's what, one thing I like, for example, about responsible disclosure programs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it shows, you know, some companies are open to that and uh, are open to actually being shown what kinds of problems that they have. It's also extremely smart, by the way, because it's, yeah. uh, it's far, a business model, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's far cheaper to pay bug bounties than it is to uh, hire a <laughs> humongous uh, yeah. internal pen testing department. But all this, not, not that you shouldn't have one, but all, all the same, you know. <sighs> That's a minimum I think you should do with a responsible disclosure. But, um, but yeah, but it, anyway, it's, uh, 
yeah, just, just actually convincing the people in charge, so the C-level executives convincing them that uh, there's a problem and that uh, budget needs to be allocated for it uh, is, a big, uh, is a big step. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the, the, what I was thinking is, the, <coughs> is uh, of course, technology is one thing, but very often the, the human uh, is, the, is the weak factor as well. Okay? Like, like sure. the spam mails are getting better. They, they used to sure. be really uh, crap, but right. sometimes they are quite good in social... Uh, mm -hmm. How do you call it? Social engineering, I yep. think uh, uh, um, they call it. So uh, over there, is that teaching people? Is that so? What should we do to uh, to be more aware of ourselves? And can we be uh, uh, so aware that we understand uh, well, and that, that people don't don't know we and they know so much about them in the mail, for example. Right. Yeah, I mean, people should be made more aware, but like I said, I mean, if it's really, really well crafted, they're yeah. going to click, you know, and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about that. Uh, so, you know, so the main thing is when they do click and assume that they will click because mm. they will, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the question then is, can you detect it? You know, so after the fact, after they have clicked, are you going to notice? Because, <laughs> of course, the first step in, con in doing any kind of containment and remediation is noticing. <laughs> so if your detection isn't there, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, then th there's absolutely no way you can, uh, can continue to react. Of course, uh, the modern buzzword nowadays is uh, APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. And, you know, <laughs> it's the kind of thing that uh, is, is, is causing, uh, <laughs> you know, manager types <laughs> and C-level types to uh, allocate more money towards security as they should. But, yeah. uh, but I think that that to a certain extent is, you know, the new world <laughs> that, that they're in. I mean, you know, why wouldn't people take, I mean, if they really want to target a particular organization, then they're actually going to take the time to do a bit of recon, you know, to actually look at LinkedIn, see, see who the employees are. I mean, it's really not that hard to write a good phishing mail. I mean, you can go onto LinkedIn and see who knows who and see what role they play and see what team they're in and, or what their product they're in charge of. I mean, it's really not that hard mm -hmm. to get enough contextual information to actually write a, a phishing mail with good grammar, <laughs> yeah. you know, or even in, in Dutch, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because people aren't used Used to, used to getting that. Yep. You know, I mean, there's enough things that you can do, you know, to, to, to actually make it convincing. You're not all going to be, you know, brother-in-laws or <laughs> from Nigeria or something, yep. you know. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's the spam. That's, <laughs> that, that's just, you know, that's just a, a wide dragnet. But, uh, but yeah, but there's so much stuff out there to, to help the attacker. So Yeah. Yeah. Before you said the internet we have is the best we can do, but no, if, if, well, if you were able to rebuild it from scratch, what would you change? I don't know, on, on three or four topics. Right. Um, I definitely think that more of the uh, protocols would need to have uh, crypto <laughs> built mm -hmm. in uh, on a deeper layer than it is now, because of course now uh, crypto is sort of more uh, added on uh, later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, because we're still having uh, all kinds of problems uh, with. Uh, well, I mean, even things we can solve sometimes, like uh, IP spoofing or email spoofing or uh, DNS spoofing or or other protocols. Uh, you know, I mean, there are technical solutions that, in theory, can help to solve some of these problems. I mean, you know, but just getting people to adopt those solutions sometimes and, and to actually use them. <laughs> it's a hard one. Yeah, I mean, there's too many backwards compatibility issues at this point, <laughs> and too much retrofitting, and mm -hmm. uh, that is a hard problem to solve. So, I mean, if I did have to go about building a new internet, then I would probably uh, try and build it more with uh, strong crypto as the basis. But that being said, I mean, I'm pessimistic that building a new internet uh, makes any sense at all, mm -hmm. because there's so much of a critical mass <laughs> of, uh, of people and things and information on the current internet that, uh, I mean, it's been hard enough just trying to adopt IPv6 <laughs> of all yeah. things. Yeah. And, th and that's just one tiny aspect. And if we can't even manage that, then how do we think we're going to replace the internet? I mean, really. <laughs> So how do you f see the future then of the internet? I don't know. We sit here again in 20 years. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a futurist, so I can only uh, <laughs> only say uh, it's easier to say, you know, five, 10 years than 20. But uh, let's say five. Then. But we're moving towards, look, I mean, we're, we're moving towards a world where uh, of, of pervasive computing. Uh, where more and more is going to be online. Uh, eventually, of course, we're going to have more uh, smart, 
interfaces, smart uh, wearables, <laughs> all kinds of smart appliances. Uh, perhaps we're even going to start having, heaven knows, I mean, you know, all kinds of different flexible displays, maybe mm -hmm. e-wallpaper, I mean, you know, on our walls. <laughs> I'm not talking about the background on your computer. I mean, computing and also networking is going to uh, become more pervasive. Perhaps at some point they might, might also start improving uh, power uh, issues with uh, pervasive computing, making be better batteries that are smaller, and perhaps use, even using inductively powered mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, computers. You already have that to a certain extent with smart cards uh, and uh, RFID tags. But uh, you know, b before you know it, uh, perhaps they'll uh, start making that technology better, so you can sort of beam over power. I mean, it sounds kind of scary, but uh, but I mean, it, it, it works. Um, and if that gets any better. Then yeah, I mean we're going to start getting all kinds more computers <laughs> everywhere mm -hmm. integrated into every part of our life, and that all is going to have so many different kinds of protocols that probably every new company is going to come up with their own variant. <laughs> you know, some of it's going to be pr proprietary and secret. Some of it might be open if we're lucky. You know, we'll have more standards made by committee that aren't going <laughs> to be gotten wrong. And at the end of the day, you know, we're going to still be faced with more and more decisions about so uh, people start j jumping from device to the next new device leaving platform joining a next platform is that the, the future then oh absolutely and and i think computers are going to continue seeming less and less like computers and more and more like other things mm -hmm. i mean right now we're walking around with cell phones but at some point that might just be integrated with uh I mean, Google Glass in a lot of ways is very hokey, but uh, <laughs> but you know it's going to continue to get better. And yeah. at a certain point, we might uh, well, and also the cost is going to come down, so we might start getting more uh, you know heads up displays built into our glasses and perhaps uh, connected with uh, you know with our uh, our headphones, uh, which uh, can to give us sound uh, anywhere. Connected with uh, our watches, you know, <laughs> which uh, perhaps might uh, you know. At some point, probably our, our watch is going to be as powerful as uh, you know a, a current <laughs> data center. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's already how it's, especially if you have it over the next twenty year life, uh, twenty year span. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, once they start bringing in uh, you know different kinds of uh, you know uh, DNA computing and uh, <laughs> quantum computing, and you know, I mean, things can you know, even start to exceed Moore's law for all we know. Uh, so that all uh, can. Uh, incredibly change things and and before we know it i mean we might even not even know we're dealing with computers all the time i mean and, and this is already happening of yeah. course with all the embedded computers we have nowadays you know in our cars and our but appliances think, yeah. wouldn't the concept of security be much more important than the, the privacy aspect when the device is everywhere the privacy aspect maybe will disappear totally Right. Well, to a certain extent, we're already there today, yeah. um, and it's only going to get more so. But, you know, is that stoppable? I don't know. It, again, this is research, and this is the. It, it's also hard to say. You know what researchers twenty years from now are going to come mm -hmm. up with. So, I mean, I, I sort of hope that uh, both the grassroots uh, and the academia and the industry, you know, on the security side, I hope that we'll continue tackling things and. Uh, I doubt this is a problem that's ever going to be solved, but I hope at least that uh, in this cat and mouse game that uh, that we can keep up uh, at least a little bit as technology evolves.